Thank you for joining us today. I'm Diane Boyle, NAPA's uh, Vice President of Government Relations. We're about a week away and a few hours out from the elections being over. And if you're anything like me, like the hurricanes hitting Louisiana, I'm ready for this to be over. But today we're gonna to give you what we hope will be a fun peek into the polling and trends, as well as what different outcomes could mean to our policy objectives. It's an understatement, I think, to say that this election cycle has emotions running pretty high. But I wanna assure you that NAFA is here for you regardless of the outcome. We've seen successes under all combinations throughout our 130 year history. We know how to navigate personalities and politics to produce favorable policy. Heck, this isn't even our first pandemic. Well, it is my first pandemic, let me be clear. But it isn't NAFIS first pandemic. Just like your product, we're here in the times of need. So let's get started. We're gonna first shift to the presidential pathway, which we need 270 um, electoral votes to get there. We're gonna to turn to Mike Hedge, who's gonna give us a little bit of detail on the road to 270. Mike, you wanna kick us off? Thanks, Diane, and uh, welcome to everyone on the, on the uh, webinar. <clears throat> I'm sure most of you are following polling for the upcoming presidential election, but there's a good chance that many of you, especially after the 2016 results, have some skepticism regarding the accuracy of the polls. Uh, currently, some polls have Biden up by as small as a two point margin, while on the extreme end, uh, there's a Cal Berkeley poll, and don't be dissuaded by Cal Berkeley, that has Biden up 36 points on Trump. Uh, I don't know who they're asking on those kind of numbers, but obviously that's a variable. Interestingly enough, though, the polling averages are not that different in terms of Biden being up on Trump as the way they looked in 2016 with Hillary being up on Trump uh, at this point in the election. Trump still has a path to 270 electoral votes, uh, which he needs to win re-election, but it requires everything to essentially break in his direction a second time. Persuadable voters in battleground states uh, will need to overwhelmingly swing in Trump's favor. He'll have to crack uh, the crucial voting blocks that took him to victory uh, four years ago, and his turnout operation will need to dramatically outperform Joe Biden's in what's been an ex extraordinarily turbulent year. The biggest polling strike this time around has really been, and there's been a lot of talk of it since the midterm election two years ago, uh, is white educated suburban women and how they've kind of bailed. Uh, President Trump won uh, 53, 54% of the white uh, female vote in 2016. And a lot of those voters have, uh, had, have had a lot of second thoughts about him this time around. While Trump has multiple roads to victory, his most likely route hinges on winning two crucial battleground states, Florida and Pennsylvania. If he can claim both and hold on to other Sunbelt states that he narrowly carried in 2016, namely North Carolina and Arizona, while playing defense in states like Georgia and Ohio, which he won easily in 2016, but where Biden's been much more competitive this time around. Um, Trump's campaign is also continuing to pour a lot of time and money into Wisconsin and Michigan, longtime Democratic strongholds that he had managed to flip by the slimmest of margins four years ago, uh, while also trying to defend Iowa and Maine's second congressional district and possibly pick up Nevada and Minnesota, two states that Hillary won, but the Trump campaign believes they're competitive in this time around. Now, Trump's campaign points to other factors pointing in their favor. The campaign and the Republican Party have spent years investing in powerful voter outreach operation and have, uh, it's like 2.5 million volunteers knocking door to door each week. And I, I've always tried to picture in my head how that works in the pandemic, but it, it is happening. I'm just glad no one's knocking in my door. Um, and Trump voters also are more enthusiastic about their candidate where a large percentage of Biden voters are just Trump haters. And so it, it, it's interesting how that'll play out and drive uh, people going to the polls. The Trump campaign has stated they feel better about their pathway to victory right now than they have at any point of the campaign this year. And that optimism is supposedly based on data, not a sense of feel and the fact that a lot of people who vote for Trump don't necessarily respond publicly that they will vote for Trump. Uh, but the polling does show Trump trailing um, and he's closely matched in nearly every state he needs to win to reach 270 electoral votes. Bearing some kind of major upset, Trump needs to hold on to at least one of the three Rust Belt states he won in 2016, which are uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Um, most recently, polls released on Wednesday show Biden with a clear advantage in Michigan and a slight lead in Wisconsin 
in Pennsylvania polls have been kind of inconsistent and vary in the size of the lead that Biden has. However, as I insinuated earlier, in those three states, Clinton, Clinton also led in the polls in the final weeks of 2016. What could end up being Trump's biggest area of concern is that a large number of states that he won comfortably last time are currently close. And Biden is liked better than Clinton. And polls also suggest there are now fewer undecided voters which is a large block that broke for Trump in the final weeks leading up to the race four years ago. To talk more about on the House side of this, I'm gonna pass it back to Diane. Great, thanks Mike. Um, it takes 218 members to create a majority in the House and 51 in the Senate. Now the Senate is a far more complicated body than the House and it takes really 60 members to make, a legis make legislation filibuster proof. So when we say the magic numbers, we're looking at 218, and while the slide says 51, I believe it's, it's 60, um, because I need that magic to make the legislation work. So those are the numbers that we're kind of looking for. And to Mike's point, talking about the, the House a little bit, Republicans are gonna need to pick up 18 cent seats in order to win the majority. And the Senate, the Democrats need four seats to obtain a simple majority. Um, if the Democrats win the presidential race, then they only need three seats because Vice President Harris would then have the tie-breaking vote. Now, here's where the math is working in favor of Democrats. If you look at the slide, there are 26 toss-ups with 16 Republicans and nine Democrats in that field. So that's where you're going to have to see the, the shift, and that's where it's going to get complicated. Um, in order to really see the House flip the majority to have Republicans take control over Democrats, you're going to have to see a red wave. So you're, you're looking no one in, in the polls, handful of really strong Republicans that I'm not sure where their focus has been, see a red wave. But most people see if there's going to be a wave, that's going to be a blue wave. So in order for the House to flip, you'd have to see that red wave. You'd have to see President Trump win. You'd have to see the Senate flip, and then you may see the House, but really the, the math is working against Republicans on, on taking over the House. So I think we're basically going to see the House pick up a few more Democratic seats probably than, than Republican. They'd still maintain the control, and so it will basically continue pretty much like we've seen it in the 116th Congress, the 117th Congress will look the same. I'm going to now hand it over to Judy because this is where it gets really interesting is when we talk about the Senate because the Senate is much more narrow in, in scope and, and there's a lot in play there. So Judy, I'm going to hand off to you to, to talk a little bit about the, the Senate races and where the challenges lie there. Yeah, thanks, Diane. As you say, the Senate is in the anything can happen category with regard to the election results and which party might hold the majority in the Senate. And it's actually possible that we won't know the result until January. As you've noted, the issue is that 35 of the Senate seats that are up for re-election this year, of which almost twice as many are Republican as Democrat, there's an abundance of seats that are either lean Republican, lean Democrat, or toss-ups. And that's what's got everybody with eyes on the Senate at this election, at least those of us in the nerdy category. Uh, and since the Democrats only need, as you noted, um, a net of four seats to take the majority or three if Biden um, wins the administration and Vice President Harris becomes the tiebreaker, these are close races that deserve some serious watching. There are two current Democrat senators whose races are in the lean or toss up categories. Uh, Doug Jones of Alabama and Gary Peters of Michigan are both either um, lean or toss up. Polling shows that Senator Jones is trailing and it is anticipated that that Alabama seat will become Republican in the next Congress. Gary Peters on the other hand holds a slight lead over his challenger and Senator Peters has historically been a proponent of NAFA legislation uh, and that race is rated um, a very lean Democrat. It is the toss-up races and even some of the lean Republican races that is where all the fun begins. Um, can a Democrat running on the value of his ethics and his integrity 
unseat a Republican in North Carolina, even after he admits to having an extramarital, I don't know, something just a few weeks ago. So Cal Cunningham's challenge to Senator Tom Tillis is still anybody's guess. In South Carolina, Senator Lindsey Graham, can he hold his seat after a seeming betrayal of his longtime friend, the late Senator John McCain, and after Trump's recent tweeting with his unhappiness with Senator Graham? There are two Republican women, Senator Susan Collins of Maine and Senator Joni Ernst from Iowa, whose races are too close to call. Uh, Montana is also too close to call pitting Republican Senator Daines against former Democrat Governor Bullock. Um, two more sitting Republicans seem to be in even more trouble if we believe the polls. And remember, as Mike alluded, um, polling is limited by who you ask, what you ask, and how many you ask. Uh, both Senator Gardner from Colorado and Senator Martha McSally from Arizona, who was appointed to complete uh, Senator McCain's term, may be beaten by well-known Democrat challengers, former John Hickenlooper in Colorado, former governor, and uh, former uh, astronaut Mark Kelly, who is, I, we say in my family, also known as the former Congresswoman, the husband of former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, who suffered a traumatic brain injury in a shooting in 2011 in Tucson. And then you add to this, these possibilities that anything can happen in the oh my gosh, could that possibly be true category, uh, Republican Senator uh, John Cornyn from Texas and Alaska Senator Dan Sullivan and the open seat in Kansas are all only lean Republican in this year's polling. Uh, and so if we go to the next slide and the what if and the messes of the timing of this is Georgia. Senator David Perdue and Senator Kelly Loeffler may both end up in runoffs in January due to Georgia's requirement that you win 50 plus votes to secure the victory. And if so, and if this other Senate races are not definitive, the Senate majority may not even be known until these Georgia races are decided. If the Republicans hold the majority in the Senate, but Biden wins the presidency, certainly Biden's ability to enact his priorities become very challenging. Uh, this is what I call gridlock. And there is a certain school of thought that gridlock in Congress is a very good thing. If the Dems do take the majority and Biden wins the presidency, then certainly the President Biden would have a green light to pursue much of his agenda, but with a really strong yellow caution because he will have a very small majority in in all likelihood. If Trump is reelected and the Republicans do keep the Senate, as Diane and Mike have said, we will expect more of the same. And if neither party takes the majority, a 50-50 Senate would be very rare. In fact, it's only happened three times in our history. And of course, the vice president would break any tie vote, but chairmanships, control of the Senate calendar, budgets, in fact, in in the Senate, if the, if the majority flips, instead of changing the signs outside the doors to the offices that say majority or minority, all the people move. So um, control of the Senate, control of the budget, um, all become very challenging to negotiate, especially in such partisan times. And so in the Senate, are, are we having fun yet? This is gonna be an interesting, um, I don't know, possibly months of watching electoral results. Usually it, it's, it's a night with a little bit of wine, but we could, we could have months watching the electoral results. And so now moving on, we have um, a great opportunity for you. Um, we will hear from NAFA's outside counsel, Danny Kehoe and Pat Raffanella for a look from their insider point of view about this election. Here we go. Okay. Hey, Pat and Danny, thank you for being here. Uh, for folks on the call, Danny and Pat are both tax attorneys. They are longtime NAFA consultants and Washington insiders, and they have agreed to share their often differing points of view on the 2020 election. 
Their centers of influence also differ, giving NAFA a very impressive coverage in Washington, D.C. So here we go, you guys. Here's the question. All of us know not to put too much faith or hope or angst in the current polling, but we will be talking about the various what-if scenarios as the result of the 2020 election, and we are curious to hear your views about the future of the Senate. Please talk about which party might be in the majority, by what margin, and what all of this could mean to insurance, financial services people, and especially NAFA members. Here we go. Hi, everybody. Hi, Pat, especially. Uh, I'm way too chicken to try to forecast how the elections are going to turn out. Uh, if we go with the current polls, which is something we all learned the painful way in 2016, uh, not to take too seriously, uh, then it looks like we will have a Democratic president. Uh, right now, the polls show it's too close to call in the Senate. Uh, it could go either way. Uh, but if you base things on history, uh, they, they tend to break all one way. So if we wind up with the polls predicting a Democratic president, we probably will wind up with a Democratic Senate as well. Uh, that is not a prediction. It's just a commentary on history. Uh, either way, we're going to have a pretty frenetic upcoming legislative session. I mean, it'll start with lame duck, which is the current President Trump, the current Republican controlled Senate, where they will have to fund the government before December 11th, or the government will shut down. And that will attract every priority issue currently pending, particularly by the party that's not going to be in control in 2021. Uh, so that's my view of what's going to happen in two weeks, Pat. What do you think? Thanks, Danny. And thanks to all of you out there that is continuing to support NAFA and keep us uh, working together with you. We appreciate the opportunity and we enjoy it quite a bit. But I'm not as smart as Danny, so I will make predictions. Um, <laughs> and, and fortunately, we're not right. Nobody take notes. I don't want anybody to have written this down so that I can pretend I'm right after the election. But I think if you asked me this three months ago, I would have said there's no way that um, the Republicans could hold the Senate if Donald Trump loses. Uh, I out, now actually see a couple of paths forward for Republicans to hold on to the Senate barely, even if Donald Trump loses. And to the point Danny made about how good are the polls, Right now, the momentum clearly is on the Democratic side, on uh, Vice President Biden. He's, after 47 years of elected politics, he's finally really getting lucky. The COVID uh, pandemic has been the best thing for his campaign. One, <clears throat> Donald Trump has not handled it well in the eyes of most Americans, particularly in the eyes of independents and um, older voters, uh, which that is a key demographic for him. And he is not polling very well among those people. They feel like he has not done a good job with COVID because, and it's a really important issue for those people because they feel they're most at risk. Um, but that said, again, you have to remember, it's not the national vote popular vote that matters. Trump is down anywhere from 10 to 12 points in national polls. But again, that's skewed by huge margins in California, uh, Illinois, New York, New England, and that. But of course, even though, even if he's there, the polls are off by five or 6%, he's still down five or 6% nationally. The trick is going to be early on to watch Florida uh, and North Carolina, I think, on election night. So right now, Donald Trump is in the margin of error, winning in North in Florida and right within the margin of error in North Carolina. So there's also, I think, an underpolled group of people that 
Uh, it used to be called the Law and Order. For those of you who remember Nixon's campaign after the 68 riots, he ran as the Law and Order president. Trump is going to try to follow that playbook. They're calling it public safety. But people are understandably nervous about what they've seen on television with uh, looting and rioting in the cities. So I think that there is a, a chance that Donald Trump wins the White House. I think it will be very close. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania, Michigan are two states that have to come home for him to make it. You know, Florida is essential. There's so many states that uh, if he doesn't win them, he's down and out for the count. But as far as the Senate goes, you know, the Republicans have a lot at stake. They have many, um, many more. They have 24 uh, senators up for re-election. And if you look at South Carolina, North Carolina, Montana, Maine, Colorado, Iowa, Arizona, Georgia, is those are states where the Republicans have tended to be behind, except Alabama, where that will flip from Democrat to Republican without much question. But in Colorado, Arizona, uh, North Carolina, the Republican incumbents are generally trailing, but they've been in the margin of error for the last two months, and that hasn't moved. So that those states they could pull out. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we're going to have, well, on November 3rd, we're not going to know who controls the Senate. And Danny knows this very well because Georgia, you have two Senate seats up. You have Senator Perdue up for his normal reelection. He had a primary earlier this year and is running in a general election uh, against uh, a former a congressional candidate named Ossoff. Um, but Senator Perdue, who took Senator Isaacson's seat in January, is running in a jungle general election on November 3rd, which means there are about 15 or more people in that race. And if nobody gets a majority, the top two vote getters go to a runoff on January 5th. And it seems um, like a, it's extraordinary, extremely likely that that will be a runoff. It also looks like because there are several candidates in the Purdue seat that there will be a runoff there. Because Senator Purdue is running your traditional Republican Senate race, run to your right in the primary, run back to the center uh, in the general, but he's being drowned out by Senator Leffler and Congressman Collins fighting for the Trump base and just running far to the right. So I don't think we will, we'll have two seats that are still open, I believe, on January 5th. And I think that will be the determinant factor, whether it's 51, 49 Republicans or vice versa. Danny, why don't you talk about how you see the legislation starting? Well, I think the first thing out of the box when we get to 2021 will be another gigantic coronavirus crisis aid bill. Um, and I think that's regardless of who wins the presidency or control of either the House or the Senate, we should pause a moment to say that pretty much no one thinks that the Democrats will lose control of the House. The only question is whether they'll gain seats or lose seats. Um, there will also, I think, be a very early effort to correct the problems with the ACA, with Obamacare, with the Supreme Court, considering whether or not the entire law is unconstitutional. I think especially if the Democrats gain control uh, in the Senate and or in the White House, uh, there will be an almost immediate effort to reestablish re the penalty for uh, an individual mandate requirement so, so as to remove the constitutionality uh, argument um, and or to re-establish uh, protection against pre-existing condition situations. Um, I also think that if the Democrats are in control, uh, just about everything they try to do that costs money, they will try to pay for by way of raising the corporate income tax and or making some changes to the TCJA, the 
the Trump Republican tax reform bill of late 2017. Um, and one of the things that's at big risk there is the deduction for uh, closely held business income, uh, which is pretty important to a lot of our people. Um, there will also be lots of debate about income limits on uh, tax benefits um, and things like minimum wage and paid leave. It, it's going to be a pretty frantic legislative uh, yeah, session, I think. Pat, do you agree? I do. You've got it spot on. There's going to be a lot of spending. And, you know, there'll be an infrastructure bill, there'll be tax bills, there'll be reconciliation. But I, I think we're coming to the our allotted time. But I have one question for you, Danny. Senator Speaker Pelosi has introduced a bill to create a commission on the 25th Amendment, which is the amendment that says if the president is incapacitated, the vice president takes over. And um, Speaker Pelosi's bill would give the House of Representatives a role in determining that. But she did say this was not about President Trump. This is about future presidents. So is she planning on a coup so that to take Biden out and put her California sister, Senator Harris, in as president? I don't think so, Pat. Uh, I think that was a, what, what is known colloquially here in Washington, D.C. as a political stunt. And my guess is it will not survive 2020 uh, unless Trump wins re-election, in which case it might develop some legs. Fair enough. Um, you guys have sort of queued me up to be able to, to say that in our webinar, we're going to be moving now from political what ifs scenarios to what that means in policy and issues. And I think that you have um, actually brought home the point that NAFA and NAFA members will be very busy. There is a lot of work for us to do in the way of building our grassroots and continuing to develop that and our PAC and to be prepared for the kinds of uh, legislation that may be coming down the pike with or without Senate being um, e either a gridlock or a green light. So we appreciate everything you've done for us. We um, look forward to our post-election webinar. We won't hold you to the crystal balls. We know nobody's crystal ball is reliable these days, but we'll be doing a post-election webinar on November 19th. And we don't need to take notes, Pat, because we've got you recorded. So we'll see where you guys come out on this. Thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it so much. Thank you. This was great. Bye, Danny. Thanks, you guys. Bye, Jen. Okay, as you can see, we're all a little gun shy of polls after 2016, but um, we still have fun in poking at each other and making predictions and doing all of that fun stuff. We're gonna shift now. Um, we've talked a lot about what was going on in the presidential race, as well as some of the congressional races. So we'll shift from those federal elections right to state elections. And then we'll talk a little bit about state policy and follow up with a little more on the policy options that we may face um, in a what if scenario. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to our state chapter director, Julie Harrison, to talk about what we see in the state. Julie. Thanks, Diane. Uh, state campaign activity is really busy right now. Um, the only states that are not holding elections um, in either chamber are Alabama, Louisiana, Maryland, Mississippi, New Jersey, and Virginia. Therefore, we have 86 state legislative chambers holding elections in 2020. Currently, uh, and you can take a look at this slide here, Republicans control more chambers than Democrats. Uh, there is a Republican majority in 59 chambers and a Democratic majority in 39 chambers. Since uh, 2018, um, however, Democrats have been chipping away at their state legislative seats and have started to grow their control of the chamber. So it'll be interesting to see if they're gonna be able to build on their momentum next week or not. Um, also not depicted in this slide, but important to note are trifectas. And that occurs when a single party controls both chambers and the governor's office. Uh, right now, the US has a total of 36 trifectas. 
15 are Democrats and 21 are Republicans. Um, next slide, please. So here is a look at states with chambers that are gonna be hot to watch next week. Um, I'm telling you, the results in Arizona will be just as exciting um, to watch as the Trump Biden results, because here we have both Republican chambers able to flip to Democrat, which would obviously completely change the landscape of that legislator. Um, also, we're going to keep a close eye on Texas, um, you know, a state that we've always considered to be, you know, a deep red Republican state. There is a small chance um, that Democrats could win a majority in the House there. Other potential threats uh, to Republicans, as you can see, um, include the Michigan House, the Minnesota Senate, the Florida Senate, both Georgia chambers, the Iowa House, both North Carolina chambers, and both Pennsylvania chambers. Um, on the other hand, Democrat, Democrats will be really thankful um, after this is all over if they end up maintaining their control over the Alaska House and the New Hampshire Senate. Um, both of which are considered a toss up right now. Uh, the Minnesota House will also be important for Democrats to keep, as well as the New Hampshire House and the Maine Senate, like the state of Maine's Senate. It always sounds funny when I say the Maine Senate. Um, next slide. So as things stand today, um, there's almost an even split of Republican and Democrat gov governors across the country. To be a, a little more specific, there are 24 Democrats and 36 Republicans. And next week, 11 of these seats will be on the ballot. And if we wanna switch slides, of the 11 seats, two are open seats, um, including Montana, which is considered a complete toss up right now. And then Utah, um, which will almost certainly go red, but we've been wrong before. So we'll just have to wait and see of the remaining nine gubernatorial campaigns. Um, it appears pretty unlikely um, the current seats will change parties. I would say the biggest nail biter, if you're looking for one, would be in North Carolina, where Governor Cooper, a Democrat, is in a state that's like honestly been dealing with a partisan identity crisis for the past couple of years. So um, stay tuned for that one. Uh, next slide. So I know we've got people on this webinar from different states, so it's hard for me to pinpoint exactly what the election outcomes means for legislative issues in the insurance industry. As we all know, you know, COVID health concerns and economic recovery efforts are gonna be front and center in 2021, um, but we're gonna remain vigilant on legislative or regulatory proposals that would address fiduciary or best interest standards. Um, we're also gonna be looking for any um, unfair paid family medical leave requirements. Um, we'll be watching for measures that may impede our ability to protect seniors from financial exploitation. Um, and obviously we're gonna be monitoring for tax proposals that would unfairly target our industry. And then finally, I just wanted to add that while in most states, the position of the insurance commissioner is appointed by the governor, um, which is another reason to pay attention to your gubernatorial election, there are 12 states that elect their insurance commissioners. Um, five of the 12 have elections next week. Um, and these states are Delaware, Montana, North Carolina, North Dakota, and Washington. In each of these elections, the incumbent is seeking reelection. Um, in state insurance advocacy, the insurance commissioner plays a huge role, especially due to their position um, at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Therefore, if you do live in one of these states, uh, please be sure to pay attention to those election results as well. And that is it for me. I'm gonna hand you back over to Mike Hedge, um, Director, NAFA's Director of Government Relations, who's going to be speaking uh, more on policy to you all. Thank you. Thanks, Julia, I appreciate it. Uh, so, you know, I'm gonna start off with some Trump policy. <clears throat> if Trump were to uh, win re-election, and the obvious answer, uh, slide please, the obvious answer when it comes to a Trump victory in the presidential election is that we'll continue with the status quo. Of course, the question that's raised there is what exactly is the status quo when it comes to the president? There's been an overall lack of consistency, we, I think we can all agree on that, in terms of action taken by the president. We don't really know exactly what he would do moving forward. However, for the sake of argument, let's briefly discuss what the status quo would likely entail. Um, the primary focus would most likely be infrastructure, and in this case, jobs. 
the historically low unemployment rate before COVID <clears throat> was really the jewel in the president's crown. And after COVID, he's going to do everything he can to help rebuild the job market and really focus on more job creation. Furthermore, if the, the House were to remain democratic during a Trump presidency, which is likely uh, in the last few years or any indication, there'd be more gridlock than we could expect with House leadership on health policy. Uh, there is a potential for changes to drug pricing, particularly where there is common ground between House Democrats and President Trump, such as importing drugs from international locations and also boosting domestic production. This is actually identical, more or less, to the Biden platform on drug pricing. Uh, Republicans are also likely to continue to tout longstanding priorities, such as the expansion of health savings accounts, additional Medicaid flexibility, telehealth, and Medicare Advantage. On the topic of insurance more specifically, while President Trump has said that he would end the Affordable Care Act on day one of his presidency, four years later, obviously, we're still sitting here and it remains law. That said, President Trump has led efforts to weaken the ACA by eliminating the individual mandate penalty, allowing less comprehensive plans and reducing auto enrollment. And I just wanna say that I know there's a lot of information in these slides, so we will distribute these to you later on. Don't feel like you have to memorize everything. Uh, slide, please. <clears throat> For Biden, talking about Biden's agenda as president, <clears throat> slide. When he formally announced his entry into the 2020 presidential race, Joe Biden declared that he stood for two things specifically, workers who built this country and values that can bridge its divisions. Now, as the US faces from challenges from coronavirus to racial inequality, his pitch to create a new economic opportunity for workers, uh, restoring environmental protections and healthcare rights, and also he plans on focusing on international alliances. To address the immediate action of the coronavirus, Mr. Biden has vowed to spend whatever it takes to extend loans to small businesses and increase direct money payments to families. Among the proposals are an additional $200 in social security payments per month uh, and rescinding the Trump era tax cuts, as well as a $10,000 student loan forgiveness program for federal loans. Biden's bigger economic plans try to please two constituencies that traditionally support Democrats. That's uh, young people and blue collar workers. Uh, he supports raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour, a measure that is popular among young voters and is also a sign of the party's kind of move to the left. He also wants a $2 trillion investment in green energy, arguing that boosting green manufacturing jobs would ultimately help working class unions who perform most of these jobs. Slide please. Now, regulation under a Biden administration, this is what could truthfully be a little bit on the scarier side. And I don't mean that from a bias perspective, just looking at it from an insurance perspective. Um, prime example, Reg BI, the Securities and Exchange Commission Regulation Best Interest Standard, which many of you have heard of, or Reg BI, which took effect back on June 30th, requires brokers to put their clients' interests ahead of their own, but it's not a fiduciary standard. This is a positive for the industry because it sets a standard that didn't previously exist, um, but it doesn't have the same complicated and prohibitive le legal framework that DOL fiduciary had, which of course NAFA helped defeat in the courts and fought for, for the better part of half a decade. Um, however, critics of the regulation best interest standard have argued that the best interest in RBI is not defined enough. And as such, Joe Biden's platform has specifically said it would torpedo the SEC's Reg BI standard as well as the Labor Department's new rules that would align with Reg BI. And this is part of the platform. Uh, Democrats have said that they believe that when workers are saving for retirement, the financial advisors they consult should be legally obligated to put their clients' best interest first. And this is listed under the Biden platform banner of guaranteeing a secure and dignified retirement. Um, the draft goes further and it says they'll take immediate action to reverse the Trump administration's regulations, allowing financial advisors to prioritize their self-interest over their clients' financial well-being. That is a quote from Trump, from Biden. That is not a quote from us. Obviously, we disagree wholeheartedly with that kind of philosophy on the work that financial advisors and the industry does. Uh, but that's just the reality of the regulatory uh, workload we're looking at. Another thing I'll touch on very briefly, the PRO Act is, an, is another Democratic vehicle that's being advocated for by Democrats, and it looks to redefine the independent contractor relationship. And while NAFA continues to be actively engaged in all of these issues and looks for workarounds, and, and we've been working with the Democrats on these issues for a long time, so it's not that we're unprepared, it's just going to very much increase a workload. I think most of the staff could agree with that. Um, 
as it cur currently exists on the federal level, the PRO Act would redefine not only how insurance, the insurance industry operates, but also how many other industries run their business models in the US. And so there are a lot of people that would consider this an anti-business platform. Slide, please. In comparison to Trump's take on the ACA, Biden would likely work to secure the ACA and expand upon it with a Medicare-like public option for individuals to buy into. Those who qualified for Medicaid in non-expansion states would be offered premium free access. Both candidates believe that patients with pre-existing conditions should be protected. Um, that is something the Republicans have pushed for actively over the last couple of years. Both candidates believe that patients with pre-existing conditions should be protected, but the devil's in the details and Republicans have yet to offer a solid path to insurance coverage. And that's kind of been one of the uh, handicaps that the Republicans have dealt with. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court may also force the hand of Congress and the next administration to rebuild insurance coverage for millions of Americans uh, if it invalidates ACA in 2021. With the recent Supreme Court appointment uh, yesterday, uh, of course, that's a bigger issue, even more so in the upcoming election on the ACA action. COVID-19 relief will be really the first big priority, more than stimulus. I know Danny talked a little bit about this. Uh, a more centralized coordinated response, contract tracing, testing, tracking hospitalizations, relief for states and other localities, and, and looking at budget deficits. Expanding affordable coverage would be a bigger priority than drugs, although, as I mentioned, the drug platform is kind of the same between the two campaigns. If the Democrats were to win the Senate as well, which is a possibility, without Republicans to stall efforts, the Democrats would have to act and either fix the ACA or move on to the public option. And as Republicans realized a few years ago, when you control all chambers of the legislature and the presidency, you're actually expected to do something. And that could be something that trips up Democrats. The last thing I'd say is, if you're looking at a Democratic sweep, the one thing that might really be a problem for the party and how they govern is a division between the progressive wing and the more Main Street uh, center left pro-business wing. And as you know, anytime you're given power, there's the idea we can do whatever we want, but there's so much dissension within the party itself, as you saw in the primaries with Democrats on the left challenging other Democrats more in the center, that just because Democrats were to control all chambers, a lot of these programs and a lot of these promises would likely still stall out, even without Republican blocks, just because of disagreements on policy and how to move forward. And also looking down the line at, what do we as the Democratic Party do to sustain our gains in the next midterm election? So it, there's, a lot to, there's a lot to digest here. And remember, you can look at it afterward, but I think there's, uh, there's a lot that we're gonna continue looking at after the election and really getting into the legislative next year. Um, I do wanna pass over now to uh, Joe Minardi, who if you, those of you do, do not know him, he's our new PAC manager. He started about the same time that COVID started. And so the only NAFA he knows is the COVID NAFA. And uh, he's done a great job in the meantime, but I'm gonna let him take over from now on. Thanks, Mike. And that is true. I did start right as COVID was starting. So I have only known NAFA during COVID times. Um, so after getting a big dose of uh, pre-election analysis, we want to give you all a snapshot of ISAPAC's 2020 cycle overview through August so you can see where we've given, how we compare to other industry associations throughout the cycle. Um, and I will say I'm going to move a, a bit quickly through the next couple of slides. So if you would like the 2020 cycle overview, please feel free to click on the link in the chat box so you can download your own copy. Next slide. So we're gonna start with our snapshot of our disbursements in the house. Uh, as you can see, we have given to 167 house races as we were looking to build many new relationships with many of the new members uh, that were elected in 2018. Next slide. As you can see, we have given to uh, quite a few more races than some of the other associations. And as we move into the next cycle, we want to continue to be strategic and continuing to build relationships with many of the new 2020 members. Next slide. Uh, on the Senate side, we uh, contributed to 34 Senate races and in much of the same way on the House side, we want to continue to build relationships. IFAPAC focused its contributions on races that had the most potential for increasing support for our NEFA issues. Next slide. And again, much like on the House side, we also gave to a few more races than some of the other associations on the Senate side as well. And looking forward to the next cycle, 
We want to continue to support members that support our issues and continue to build strategic relationships with new and, and existing senators. Next slide. Um, we've seen in this pre-election analysis that there will most likely be many changes in the upcoming 117th Congress uh, with as many as 50 new members in the House and Senate. We want to be able to hit the ground running as soon as the election is over and we need the ability to help with debt retirement, especially where the pay to play rules have prevented us from giving. Um, and we need the ability to, to do that. And we need to start building relationships with these new members right away. And being able to do this starts with you and it starts right now. Uh, if you haven't yet contributed to IVPAC, we want to encourage you to start today, click on the link in the chat box and contribute monthly. That way we can be proactive. And like I said before, hit the ground running as soon as elections are called next week. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to the grassroots side um, introduce my colleague, Maggie, our NAFA grassroots director, who will tell you a little more about all the new changes we can expect in the new Congress. Thanks, Joe. Um, and then Joe sort of left me here with a great place to start, and that is we really are going to need to uh, hit the ground running and building relationships. Regardless of what happens in this election, whether or not we see an increase in sort of Democratic seats, Republican seats, whoever, you know, who wins the presidency, what have you. Um, at the end of the day, we have an enormous amount of districts in the House and the Senate that we know are going to have new legislators. And this is because we've had legislators that have retired, they've resigned, um, they've passed, they've lost their primary. Um, any any reason really, but there are 51 seats right now that will definitely have a new legislator in 2020. So these are the first places that we're looking at um, when we're saying, you know, we're really going to need to build these relationships. Um, from there, we're going to be looking at sort of the seats that when we were looking at the toss up states and the, and the seats in the House um, or the Senate that Judy and Diane were talking about. And there's a good chance that some of those might, you know, switch not only control, but, um, you know, obviously when you switch control, you're switching sort of who the legislator is. And we're going to need to build relationships there because as a nonpartisan organization, we need to have relationships with every member um, of our legislator, uh, legislature. Um, and this also follows if you are in a state that has a state election this year. I, I know I personally am not, I live in Virginia, um, but many of you are in states um, that have your state legislatures having elections. And so then you're not only building relationships with your new member of Congress or your new Senator, um, but your new assemblyman, your new state Senator, what have you. And so the question is, how do we do that? Um, Joe mentioned one right off the top of the bat, and that's helping with debt retirement money, um, particularly in races where we were unable to support a candidate due to the pay to play rule. Um, we'll be able to come back in later and hopefully say, oh, you have some money to retire, you have debt you need to retire, NAFA can help you with that. Um, and and IFA PAC will be happy to, you know, help you with a check. Um, we also, you know, our our lobbyists will be going in um, both on the federal and state level and, and meeting um, probably virtually uh, with new legislators so that they know NAFA. But the most important thing and the tool that we have in our arsenal is you. Um, so any relationship you have or are willing to build is really crucial to our advocacy success. Um, and it'll benefit not only NAFA, um, but your business and your clients in the long run. Um, so what NAFA asks of you guys um, is if you have a relationship with an existing lawmaker, you can always let us know on our advocacy action center at nafa.org.advocate backslash advocate, <laughs> sorry. Um, and this is great because sometimes you have a relationship with a legislator, maybe you haven't let us know yet because they've been sitting sort of um, on the Armed Services Committee, and we don't really do a lot with the Armed Services Committee. Um, and who knows, next next year they might be on financial services, or they might be on ways and means. Um, and it'll be really important for us uh, to make sure that we have a deeper bench, uh, and we know exactly who knows those folks in the district. If you have a relationship with either a newly elected lawmaker, or at this point a candidate, um, you can email us at advocacy at nafa.org. Um, our Advocacy Action Center, unfortunately, does not switch over to the new legislators until, you know, they're actually legislators. So this period between November and January, um, if you just shoot us an email, we'll make sure that when we get going in January that we have all that new information loaded into our system for you uh, so that we know who all the relationships are. 
Um, but if you're sitting here and you're saying, all right, so the, no, the election is a week away and then you know we don't start anything until January, what can I do now? The most important thing you can do if you haven't already done so is vote. Um, vote in person if you can, either early or on election day. And if you must vote by mail, we recommend that you do so ASAP uh, to make sure that you get your ballot in um, and validated and everything. Um, and there's no hiccup when it comes to that. Uh, if you have any questions about the voting rules in your state or you're looking to find more information about early voting locations, I highly recommend vote.org. Personally, I actually got on there yesterday to help my mom find an early voting location because she had no idea where to early vote um, and it couldn't have been easier. Um, so I hope you all vote. Um, no matter who you vote for, I hope that you vote. And um, thank you guys. I think I'm going to turn it over now back to Diane. Thanks, Maggie. Um, I love that vote, vote, vote. The team knows that I love the graphics. It doesn't take much to excite me, and that does it. I love the vote, vote, vote. We're wrapping up now. Um, hopefully, we've provided you with some insight. As I said, polling is kind of wacky. What we're seeing is it's not 2016 polling, but we do we know if the 2020 polling is is right? We'll find out. Um, as Maggie talked about, you really are a greatest asset. And for a deeper dive on building those relationships with the newly elected, you can join us on November 11th. Meet Matt. Um, he's very excited about um, the election preview too. Then on November 19th, we're going to gather again. Well, as you know, Pat, Danny, I, Judy. I think I think everyone hit on. You know, chances are immediately following the election, we're not going to have all of the election results, but we're going to have some. And so on the 19th, we're gonna gather and start telling you what we know. And that's gonna include exciting stuff like who's gonna be the committee chairs? What are the open committee seats? Who's gonna land in those? What are, relationships do we have there? What does that mean? How does that shift policy? Will Senator Sanders lead the Department of Labor? Um, we'll have cabinet appointments. They just struck the fear into Judy with that statement. Um, but there, there are lots of changes and, and that's what we do. We're going to monitor that and figure out how we play and how we strategically address those challenges that we're going to face. We're going to face challenges regardless of what the election outcomes are. As I stated from the beginning, NAEP has been in this for 130 years. We've seen all kinds of matchups between who controls the Senate, who controls the House, who's sitting in the White House which governors are in control, what state legislatures look like. And what we do, as Maggie said, is the nonpartisan organization, we figure out how do we best represent the insurance and financial services industry. And we'll continue to do that. Our workload's gonna to continue to, to grow. Mike alluded to that. As you start seeing, you know, you know, with this administration, we followed the tweets and have taken our lead there as to when we need to engage and when we need to shift. Um, the next administration may operate differently, but we've known those individuals as well. We'll identify those relationships and we'll continue to move forward. I would encourage you to also watch your inboxes later this week. Um, we have an election night game that we're gonna share with you. Super excited about that. You can play with your family and friends. You can guess how what is the right path to 270, who you think is gonna get there, who gets there first, We'll look at the control of the Senate. You can make your predictions there, compare with whoever you're social distancing with, figure out who wins. Then I wanna leave with, with a final statement and that's this. Remember, just like the products that you offer, Nathan is here. We're here to protect you through whatever, you've gotta be kidding me, is tossed our way. And we've had a lot of, you've gotta be kidding me, tossed our way this year between the pandemic, working at home, Joe only knowing us through Zoom for the, the longest period of time. But you know what? We pulled together, we've gotten through it. This is what our industry is designed to do. It's what your association is designed to do. It's a pleasure to work with you. We're gonna go back and check and see if we had any questions in the chat box that we weren't able to address in the presentation. We'll get back to you on those. Again, watch for the game plan to join us on the 11th and the 19th of November. And thank you so much for participating. This concludes our webinar.